Hello, and thank you for joining uh, a Citizen Watchdog Presents our Week of Webinar series, a project of the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity. Uh, we've had a great week so far being joined on Monday by Matt Lewis talking about breaking into citizen journalism, uh, Tuesday by Kate Obenshain talking about her new book, Divider in Chief, The Fraud of Hope and Change, and yesterday with John Fund talking about his book, Stealing Elections and the Voter Fraud Issues that we're dealing with this cycle and, and certainly uh, all across the country for, for years past and probably many to come, unfortunately. Uh, today we're pleased to be joined uh, to take a look at 2012's key political races with Guy Benson from townhall.com. I'll introduce Guy in a moment, but you can ask us questions today by emailing me at telford at franklincenterhq.org, and that email address will be on the screen, or tweeting us. Uh, my Twitter is blame telford, and Guy's is Guy P. Benson. So please be asking questions as we go today. We'd love your interaction and your participation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Guy Benson, who is a conservative political commentator and analyst and reporter. He serves as political editor of townhall.com, which is one of the most read conservative sources online. In addition to that, Guy is America's youngest top market political talk show host. His radio program is heard weekly in Chicago on AM 560 WIND and here in Washington, D.C. on AM 1260 WRC. He appears regularly on the nationally syndicated Hugh Hewitt radio show, which he's also a frequent guest host of. And Guy has appeared on cable news shows ranging from Fox News to MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and everything in between. We're very pleased to have Guy with us here today. I'm very pleased to be here, and thanks so much to the Franklin Center uh, for putting this on. You guys do very important work, and also to the Leadership Institute for uh, hosting us here at their headquarters. Yes, many thanks to LI, and thank you, Guy, for being here. Let's start off for a moment talking about the presidential race uh, before we move into some of the key Senate battleground states. Uh, just a snapshot, where are we? We've closed out the third debate. Uh, polls are starting to solidify. People are starting to make up their decisions. How do you think things stand right now for Romney versus Obama? Well, I'm just a little surprised and caught off guard. I was unaware that there was this presidential race you speak <laughs> of. So if I just Google it real quick and help out. Um, no, I, I think that we've seen uh, some really interesting dynamics emerging in this race. Um, for months, weeks and months leading up to October, uh, the president seemed to have, at, at worst, a tie on his hands. And in a lot of polls, a very modest but stable two to three point lead. Uh, some of the polls would show him up to bigger leads. Some of that was due almost entirely to some of the bizarre polling samples that the pollsters were using. But things really started to, started to shift on this fulcrum point in uh, early October, coinciding directly with the first presidential debate, which was, I think, uh, an enormously influential day in the race that changed the trajectory. Because up until that point, the president had run and his campaign had run nine figures, you know, $150 million of negative advertising across the country, targeting swing states, uh, painting Mitt Romney as a liar, as a harsh far right wing conservative, as greedy, as out of touch, um, just and everything you could imagine, just bad guy not to be trusted. Um, and then Romney came out on the stage in Denver and really had an outstanding debate. Gallup said it was the biggest debate victory margin they've ever measured uh, when they pulled the question. The president clearly had an off night. Uh, it was a topic that was tough for the president, namely the economy, where he can only say so much uh, because you know the actual results speak for themselves. So Romney really came out forcefully, put on a dazzling performance, uh, and really just expressing what he believes and what he stands for. And it was really, I think, the first time that the general public got a chance to look at Mitt Romney, get a sense of who he was unfiltered, because really the entire image they had in a lot of voters' minds were heavily colored by the Obama onslaught of negative ads, and also from the media, uh, who 90% you know, of the media tend to support Democrats, even though they won't say that. I think everyone really understands that to be the case, including a lot of liberals. Public opinion polling shows that everyone understands that the media is liberal. So they really went out of their way to try to make Mitt Romney seem um, as incompetent, inept, and unlikable as possible. And Romney was finally able to go over everyone's head and speak directly to the president, making uh, that eye contact that I think a lot of voters saw and recognized, and then also to voters. And the, the image that had been so carefully built on tens upon tens of millions of dollars came crumbling down in the span of 90 minutes. 
And since then, we've seen a completely different dynamic in this race, with uh, Governor Romney holding kind of the opposite of what Obama had. Worst case scenario, a tie. Best case scenario, a modest, small, but stable two to three point lead. And even today, when we look at some of the polling, the Associated Press for the first time has Romney taking the lead 12 days out in their likely voter poll, 47, 45. Uh, Gallup, I guess Rasmussen has it at uh, 50 to 47 for Romney. And 45, 47%, not a very healthy place to be nationally for an incumbent among likely voters. But there are 12 days to go. Um, it seems like the big potential game-changing moments are out of the way, the conventions and all four debates. But you never know what people have up their sleeve. We saw an attempt by Donald Trump and Gloria Allred to sh shake things up yesterday, and that was largely a flop. But uh, there will be drama over the last 11 or 12 days, and it is going to be an extraordinarily tight contest, I think, that will ultimately be determined by turnout, for sure. Now, we know... He came off of that solid first debate, which seemed to mark a turning point in the public polling, uh, mixed reviews of the following debates, mm -hmm. uh, but still we see the shift occurring. We know it's down to just a few states electorally. Uh, putting the national polls aside, looking in at those key states that are really going to make the difference this cycle for the presidential race, where do you see that being decided? Yeah, well, I think um, one model that I keep going back to is Karl Rove uh, wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal months ago about Mitt Romney's 3-2-1 strategy to getting to the requisite electoral votes um, that he would need to be elected president. And the 3-2-1 strategy was basically Mitt Romney needs to flip six states that Barack Obama won in 2008. And he kind of he laid it out um, this way. He said the first three are Indiana, North Carolina, and Virginia. The next two are Ohio and Florida, and the final one is any other state. That's sort of the model that he built. And I've talked with the Romney campaign. I, I paid a visit to Boston a couple weeks ago, and they laid out a whole bunch of scenarios where you could take out you know, one or more of those states and insert different states. There are multiple paths for both candidates. But if you examine the 3 two, one model just uh, for argument's sake, Indiana is gone. Uh, Mitt Romney is going to win Indiana, I think, comfortably. North Carolina has shifted pretty decisively towards Romney. Uh, CNN just shifted it into a lean Romney state. There are rumors of the Obama campaign essentially pulling out. We know the Romney campaign has all but pulled out and deployed their resources elsewhere. So I think those first two are relatively safe bets. The third in that initial three is Virginia, uh, my current adoptive home state. Um, I think it's going to be a very, very close race. Uh, Governor Romney's going to have three rallies in Virginia here on Sunday. I think Paul Ryan's here today. Um, so it's going to be close. I think some of the polling has been trending towards uh, the Republicans, uh, particularly the presidential ticket. Um, and we're seeing some anecdotal evidence in some of the early voting returns, uh, the absentee voting essentially, but you can do it in person, uh, as I actually have already, that uh, counties where McCain did very well have seen significant swelling of uh, absentee voting, while the opposite has been the case for traditionally more, or at least recently, more democratic counties like Arlington County, for instance, right outside the city where there's a lot of um, government workers <coughs> who live here in Alexandria. Um, so I think it's going to be a very close race. Um, there are some pollsters that are saying it's starting to shade red, but I don't think you would talk to the Romney campaign, and I don't think they would express with any degree of strong confidence that they've got it in the bag by any stretch. So there's three. The next two are Florida and Ohio. Um, Florida is, I'd say, somewhere between Virginia and North Carolina. Not geographically, obviously, uh, but in terms of, of public opinion polls. I asked Joe Biden. He <laughs> that is true. And he, I loved, I guess he was in Ohio yesterday. He's like, it's great to be in Iowa. Um, so, but with Florida, there has been uh, this drifting towards Romney. Uh, I think eight polls in a row have shown Romney in the lead there, ranging from one point to seven points. Um, early voting, again, there are some anecdotal early clues that are looking promising for Republicans there. Um, but we have seen the president really, that there were rumors out there that the Obama campaign was thinking about 
pulling, not pulling out fully of Florida, but ratcheting down in Florida. And the Obama campaign, if nothing else, uh, they do not like showing any weakness anywhere ever. Even when they've pulled out of North Carolina, for all intents and purposes, they adamantly deny that they've done it because they don't want any crack in their facade. Because I think a big part of their strategy all along has been inevitability. Getting everyone convinced that Obama's absolutely going to win, so resistance is futile. Stay home if you don't like him. It doesn't matter. And I think that what we've seen with some of those rumors percolating in Florida is they have now renewed their interest in Florida. We've seen the president there a lot. He's going to be back down there. He was there yesterday. I think he's going to be back down there this weekend. Whether or not they actually think they can win and really put him over the top there, I'm not sure. They might be just trying to convince folks that they're still in, they're so competitive, and also drawing the resources and time of the Romney-Ryan ticket into Florida where, so that they can't be spending time elsewhere. Because you could say, if Obama's going to lose Florida, better to have Mitt Romney spending a lot of uh, energy to win Florida than being elsewhere, for example, in Ohio, which is the next state. Very, very, very close race. Um, the gap between McCain and Obama in 2008 in early voting was huge. I believe if memory serves, it was around 20 points. Republicans have been consistently closing that gap uh, pretty much every single day leading up to Election Day in the early voting. Mitt Romney is there today. Three rallies, three speeches culminating tonight um, in a town called Defiance, uh, appropriately. Uh, multiple polls over the last week have shown the race exactly tied. Rasmussen being the most recent yesterday, 48-48. There is a Suffolk poll, I think, that had it 47-47. Um, there is a Democrat-leaning poll that had Obama ahead by two points yesterday, but only 46 to 44. Again, 46, not necessarily where you really want to be as an incumbent. Uh, and then there was also a poll from CNN and Time that had Obama ahead by five points um, that there are some major issues with the poll. Let's put it that way. I don't think anyone on either side believes that either candidate is ahead by five points. D plus nine sample, oversampling of Democrats. They said that 20 some odd percent of voters have already voted in early voting, which isn't the case at all. So um, I think that it is going to be a trench warfare uh, proposition where it's going to absolutely come down to who turns out their people. Who, what does the electorate look like? If the electorate looks more similar to what it did in 2008 in terms of turnout, where Democrats uh, outnumbered Republicans in terms of party identification by seven points, even if it's within a few points of that, Obama probably wins that state. Um, if it's closer to where it was in, for example, the 2010 midterms, the 2004 election, in 2010 it was an R plus one, Republicans had a slight edge. If it's R plus one or D plus zero, D plus one, I think Romney has a real shot. Um, and so it's going to be completely 100% about base turnout. And it looks like independents in Ohio, like they are nationally, are shading and leaning a little bit towards Romney. So those are the first five of the 321. That brings us to that final state question. Where could Romney, if he wins Ohio, uh, where could Romney get that last uh, over the top push? And there's a number of answers to that. I think probably the most promising at the moment look like Colorado and even New Hampshire, as a matter of fact. Of the last maybe seven polls in New Hampshire, Romney's been ahead in four of them, tied in two of them. Um, he's, it's very narrow, one or two points, but there has been significant movement. Obama won that state pretty handily in 2008. And in fact, we've seen him make several trips there recently and put more on his calendar. Yes, and so the, the president is on defense trying to defend his turf, uh, his former turf at least, in, in New Hampshire. Colorado, there have been a number of polls showing Romney pulling slightly ahead, sort of similar in the vein of Virginia. Close, maybe heading in the red direction, but no one feels totally confident about it. Uh, anecdotally, Romney held a big rally outside of Denver at the Red Rocks venue uh, earlier in the week that drew 10,000 people, a capacity crowd. They had to turn away thousands of people. Um, so there's definitely a lot of energy and excitement in Colorado for him. And then there's, there's other states where you can look at. Iowa's very close. Um, if not tied. Uh, so some of that early voting discrepancy is again closing between Democrats and Republicans. Um, Romney's going to give a big speech on the economy tomorrow in Ames, Iowa, um, which is where uh, Iowa State University is. Um, so I think that is a very much up for grab state. Wisconsin looks like it could be very, very close. Um, you're starting to see Obama's super PAC go on the air in Wisconsin. They had pulled their money out, and now they're going back in, which is interesting. 
Um, and then you just never know. There's a poll today that shows Michigan tied. You know, if Romney wins Michigan, that's a total game changer. And then you can start saying, well, maybe you don't need Ohio. Or maybe you can, I think that the Romney campaign probably focused a lot more on Ohio than Michigan, but you never know. And then there's also rumors here and there that Pennsylvania could be competitive um, and Nevada. So that was a very long answer to your question, <laughs> but I hope we covered most of the states. Absolutely. Now, moving away from the presidential race for a moment, delving into some of the races our viewers might not be as familiar with, we know that there are probably a, a handful of Senate races that are going to determine, uh, determine which political party holds control of that chamber coming out of this election. I can run down a list of some that are listed as uh, competitive races, and I'd like to hone in on the ones that you think are going to be the most consequential. Well, can we we just, know. Let's just set the stage in terms of what is at stake in the Senate. Right now, the Democrats hold a, an effective 53-47 majority. Um, so Republicans would need to net four seats to guarantee control of the Senate. They could net three seats if Romney wins and Ryan would be the tie-breaking vote. But uh, so the number, the magic number is three or four. Of the 33 seats that are up uh, this cycle, 23 of them are currently held by Democrats or controlled by Democrats, only 10 for Republicans. So there's a lot more turf for the Democrats to be defending. Um, and I think a lot of us early on we're fairly confident that the Republicans would win back the Senate in 2012, regardless of what happens in the presidential race. I think that proposition is a lot closer now, and I think that it really could go either way. And in fact, a 50-50 split is not improbable at all. Great. Well, let's take a rundown of some of these states, then we can hone in on the ones that you think are going to be the most, uh, the most important. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of overlap here between uh, states that you mentioned will be decisive in the presidential election as well. We've got Wisconsin, Virginia, Indiana, Missouri, Arizona, Nevada, Montana, Massachusetts, North Dakota, Florida, Ohio, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Nebraska. Now, in some of those, we've seen the polls start to move apart, and many of them, they remain uh, very tight. Looking at that list, which do you think are the, the top three or four uh, that are going to be the most competitive? Well, let's let's first talk about the seats that are currently held by Republicans, that the Republicans are trying to defend and hold. Um, one of them is Indiana. Uh, this was not a race that many people thought would be close. Um, when Dick Luger was, when he lost his primary to the state treasurer, Richard Murdoch, things got very close. The Democrats have nominated this guy, Joe Donnelly, who's you know one of these so-called pro-life conservative Democrats. So the race has been neck and neck. Uh, there was a controversy just the other day with Richard Murdoch in a debate making a comment about abortion that I think was really not nearly as wild or crazy as some people are trying. The Democrats are trying to make it seem like he's pro-rape and trying to draw a comparison to Todd Aiken in Missouri. Um, I, I think that's unfair. Um, I think the race is going to remain very tight. Um, the fact that it is so close is you know, worrisome, I think, uh, for the National Republicans. At the same time, at the top of the ticket in that state, you're going to have Mitt Romney and Mike Pence, who's running for governor. And I think both of those guys are expected to win very comfortably. And so uh, the Murdoch campaign is certainly hoping that there'll be some coattails effect there and people will go down the ticket. Um, so I think Murdoch has had a very small edge in the polls. Um, and I think he also has that built-in advantage with the ticket. Uh, we'll see if the media is able to really manufacture this abortion thing into something. And keep in mind that his opponent's also supposedly uh, pro-life. So we'll see how that goes. It's a, it's a pretty conservative state, even though Obama won it. Uh, that was like the biggest shocker in yeah. 2008. Well, we have seen a lot of hay being made by the media about that abortion comment. We've seen national super PACs pouring money in, hitting him on uh, what they claim is a waste of taxpayer money for his suit against uh, Chrysler to stop the auto bailout. Um, and we've seen some fumbles in his own campaign of failure to unite establishment Republicans behind him. Do you think there's a chance that that could be a lost seat? There is a chance. Yep, there is a chance that there's a lost seat. I think if I had to put money on it, which I won't, but if I had to put money on it, I'd probably say Murdoch pulls it out, but it's, it's closer than Republicans would hope. Um, another Republican potential hold would be in Arizona, uh, which is John Kyle's retirement. Um, it's Richard Carmona is the Democrat running for that seat against Jeff Flake, a uh, Republican uh, who's currently a member of the House running for the Senate. Polls show that one pretty close to Flake with the advantage. Again, I think Flake will also benefit from Romney's performance in the state. Romney's going to win Arizona. Um, so my suspicion is that Republicans will hold Arizona. Uh, the next one is Nevada, where you have Dean Heller, 
the quasi-incumbent, he uh, filled in for uh, Senator Ensign, who resigned. Uh, Dean Heller, who was a member of the House, became the senator. He's never actually run as a senator, so this is his first time really running officially for election uh, for that office. He's running against Shelley Berkeley in Nevada, who has really, she's a Democratic congresswoman. She's had some major ethical issues um, and tons of investigations. And in all the polls that you see out of Nevada, even if Romney is running behind Obama there, uh, Dean Heller seems to be certainly holding his own against Berkeley. I think that's probably a Republican hold as well, um, although it's, again, it's close, and there might be some ticket splitting in Nevada. Um, then there's also Massachusetts, Scott Brown, Elizabeth Warren. Very close race. Um, some polls have shown Brown ahead. Others have shown Warren ahead, and especially recently. I think they have one more debate coming up. They've had four or five, I think. Um, and that's a very interesting race because you have a very heavily Democratic state. But Scott Brown is one of the most popular statewide uh, office holders in Massachusetts. His approval rating is near 60%. So the idea that you have an incumbent with an approval rating that high who is tied in his reelection bid is very rare. And that just goes to show how liberal the state of Massachusetts is. I think that's a real toss up and one of the best possibilities for Democrats to pick up a Republican seat. And one that's not on the list but uh, is Maine, Olympia Snow retiring. That one is a three-way race. It looks like Angus King, the former governor and independent, um, is the favorite in that race. Uh, the Democrats are pretty much staying out of the race because they have a candidate technically, but Angus King would be a Democrat. if he, He's running as an independent, but he would caucus with Democrats. So I think looking at that whole list, Realistically, the Democrats, which is, which is surprising, um, I think, even given maybe six or eight months ago, but the Democrats have, I'd say, a reasonable chance to pick up one, maybe two, or worst case scenario, three seats currently held by Republicans. Now, we have seen some uh, kind of sleeper races that have caused a little bit of shock among uh, those in the media who are following these races uh, here in Washington, D.C. and across the country. Um, we know that Pennsylvania and Connecticut both uh, previously thought entirely out of reach for Republicans. Mm -hmm. We've seen, I guess in Connecticut, it's slipping away a little bit. But in Pennsylvania, surprising uh, tightening of the polls there and Bob Casey's uh, efforts to maintain his seat in the Senate. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, and we'll get to some of those sleepers, I think that if you look at the seats where Republicans are poised to do well and potentially pick some seats up, one pretty much slam dunk at this point is Nebraska. Ben Nelson, a conservative Democrat who voted for Obamacare, is out. Uh, he's not running for re-election. Bob Kerry, uh, the former uh, senator from Nebraska, parachuted in from New York City, tried to run. He's down double digits in every poll to Deb Fisher, who's a conservative woman, obviously, and she's going to be the next senator from Nebraska. So there is a pickup for Republicans. North Dakota has been actually surprisingly close. I think a lot of people expected the Republicans to waltz to victory in North Dakota, uh, but the Democrats candidate Heidi Heitkamp has actually run a pretty strong campaign against Rick Berg. It looks like there is a little bit of daylight between them, though, as the Republicans look like they're beginning to assert some of that advantage. And again, Romney at the top of the ticket, that is a state that Romney will absolutely carry. So I think that's also probably a likely pickup for Republicans. So there's two. Uh, Montana. Very close race. The incumbent is John Tester, who kind of uh, fancies himself one of these independent Western um, conservative centrist Democrats, but he voted for the stimulus. He voted for Obamacare. Denny Reberg, a congressman from that state, is running against him as a Republican. Uh, the polls have shown it very close, um, with Reberg maybe slightly ahead. I think that one, again, red state, Romney's going to carry it. Um, he's going to carry it by a bigger margin, I'd imagine, than John McCain did uh, in 2008. So I think that Reberg might have some of that wind in his sails as well. So I think that's maybe the third best opportunity for a Republican pickup. Missouri uh, would have been, I think, not a total lock, but right up there uh, until Todd Akin uh, did what he did. Uh, Claire McCaskill, the incumbent Democrat, very unpopular, has been a, an Obama sycophant um, every step of the way while going home and really putting on the accent and pretending to be just like little old Claire from Missouri. But um, she's a different person in DC when she's a partisan Democrat. And so I think she was extremely vulnerable 
she poured millions of dollars into the Republican primary to try to get Todd Akin to win. Uh, she succeeded. And he then instantly and very uh, kindly to her uh, made that giant gaffe about legitimate rape and, and rape, and the body sh shutting down and all that sort of thing. Um, what's interesting, a testament to how unpopular she is and her policies and voting record uh, have been, the race is not totally out of reach. Um, there is, in fact, a, a little scandal, a little tempest, I think, last week that showed Claire McCaskill's husband, who had come up earlier in the campaign because they hadn't paid taxes on a private jet that they owned, um, while you know claiming to be for the little guy. He was apparently cutting business deals in the Senate dining room, uh, taking advantage, perhaps, of her, of her stature as a U.S. senator. So the race is probably a single-digit race at this point. And Romney's going to carry Missouri. Will enough voters be able to sort of maybe plug their nose and vote for Todd Akin just to make a point? Uh, I don't think that it should be totally written off for Republicans. Uh, then there's Wisconsin. It's a race that's gone back and forth. Uh, the former, I think, three-term governor, Tommy Thompson, in that state, a popular figure in Wisconsin, is the Republican nominee for Senate. He's running against Tammy Baldwin, who's a very liberal a uh, member of the House of Representatives who's from Madison. And so Tommy's sort of a right-of-center Republican. Tammy Baldwin is a pretty far-left Democrat. Um, and Tommy Thompson started this race with a pretty big lead, and then it totally evaporated. He sort of got lazy, didn't campaign, didn't run ads. She pummeled him. She took the lead. And now the last few polls have showed it once again balancing back out with Tommy Thompson taking a very small one- or two-point lead. So it's essentially tied. That'll be a very interesting race to watch um, at the presidential and the Senate level. Um, then there's Virginia, which is roughly a 50-50 race. I think that you've seen Tim Kaine, the Democrat, it's an open seat, maybe edging by a slight nose ahead. I think that he's outperforming Obama in the state. Um, George Allen very much has a chance to win. Um, so you know, roughly a toss up at this point. Um, Florida and Ohio are interesting because you've got the incumbent in Ohio, Sherrod Brown, very liberal, not particularly popular. His opponent is Josh Mandel, uh, a war veteran, um, very bright, young guy, who maybe he's a state treasurer. Some people might, he looks extremely young. He, he looks younger than I do, um, and he's in his early 30s. And many people think he's the advanced staffer when he shows up to speak he, at events. Right, <laughs> right, and he's the Senate candidate. So I think um, he's, he depending on the poll you look at, either running significantly behind Romney or running roughly even with Romney in the state. Um, I think that probably Sherrod Brown is ever so slightly favored to win that race. Florida, Romney is running way ahead in most polls of the Republican nominee down there, Connie Mack, against the incumbent Bill Nelson, the Democrat, who looks safe-ish, I would say. So even though Republicans, I think, have a very good chance of winning Florida at the presidential level and a 50-50 shot at winning Ohio, I'm not sure the Republicans are banking on either one of those Senate races. Um, and then that finally gets back to the races that you mentioned, um, Connecticut and Pennsylvania. I mean, you mentioned Connecticut and some of the slippage. Maybe you've seen polls more recently than I have, but that race has been even back and forth. Um, and with both still well below the 50% For threshold. weeks, yeah. With a few, a few polls have had Linda McMahon, the Republican, leading. Some have had Chris Murphy, the Democrat, ahead. Some of them have showed it exactly tied. Uh, Murphy is uh, kind of a, an ethics-challenged House Democrat um, who's just sort of a lockstep Democrat who really is rather unremarkable, a lawyer, a career politician. Linda McMahon, of course, is uh, the former first lady of the WWE, she ran in 2010 and got her name out there. She got beaten pretty handily by Richard Blumenthal, the fake Vietnam War veteran. Um, but she learned a lot of lessons. She's run a much smarter campaign this time. And I think that is a winnable race for Republicans. She's running really smart ads in Connecticut, um, explicitly appealing to Obama supporters, uh, featuring people who are planning to vote for the president, but also for her. She's positioning herself as an independent voice and an independent thinker, and uh, that, that's a, a close race. And then finally, Pennsylvania, uh, Bob Casey, I think everyone expected Bob Casey Jr. to hold his seat with relative ease. Um, that's what the polling showed early. His opponent, Tom Smith, was sort of a no-name guy, 
but Casey got the, the sort of case of incumbentitis. He's only uh, a one-term senator. He's got the family name going for him, but he was doing almost nothing in the way of trying to get reelected. He just assumed he would coast. And Tom Smith has very relentlessly come after him, spending a lot of money, saying this is a guy who is a do-nothing senator. He has no accomplishments. He's not working hard for your vote. There's a lot at stake. I can win this thing. And you've seen the polls get closer and closer to the point now where a number of polls have it statistically tied. And all of a sudden, Bob Casey's gotten off the couch and said, oh, I guess I have to campaign all of a sudden. So uh, we'll see. Pennsylvania is... Uh, a, uh, a lot of incumbents caught sleeping this cycle. Yes. Uh, in Pennsylvania could, could be the and case. Arizona and certainly in Indiana. Uh, we're getting some questions, so I want to go back for a moment. And uh, now that you've kind of thanked you, Guy, for laying out the, the map and, and the trends in the different races that are going to be very competitive and that I'm sure we'll all be up late on election night watching closely. Uh, but just looking at some trends, one of our viewers has sent in a question, how are conservatives looking for pickups in various Senate races? And I think that's an interesting question because we know we've talked a lot about Republicans versus Democrats, but we've also seen a big Republican, you know, establishment Republican versus uh, conservative all-star battles breaking out all across the country. What are the key races where you see uh, folks that may be figureheads of the conservative movement having a, an opportunity to uh, gain entry into the U.S. Senate? Sure. Well, I think you're going to see a huge upgrade in Nebraska. That was one of the races that I mentioned. Bob, uh, or rather um, Senator Nelson, Ben Nelson, was about as good as you can get uh, from a conservative perspective when it comes to the Democrat Party. Uh, Deb Fisher was Tea Party backed. She is a strong, principled conservative woman. I think there's a huge dearth of conservative women, particularly in the Senate. At this point, there's really, really only one, uh, Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire. And there's, there's other Republican women who are conservative on some things, but Deb Fisher is the full package conservative. That's, I think, a huge upgrade. Um, in Arizona, John Kyle was a very strong conservative. If Jeff Flake wins, uh, he's really been, I think, a champion of fiscal conservatism. He's been one of the leaders in the fight against earmarks and that sort of thing. So I think conservatives would be very excited to see him. Um, if Richard Murdoch can pull it out in Indiana, that is you know, very clearly a huge upgrade ideologically for conservatives from Dick Luger, who is kind of a centrist Republican establishment guy, to a much more conservative figure in Indiana. I think conservatives really need to uh, focus on helping Richard Murdoch win in the Hoosier state. And then also a state that is not competitive, that won't be close, but is still exciting, is Ted Cruz in Texas. Uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, you know, we, we salute her for her service, but uh, she was never particularly a, a grand defender of conservative principle uh, in the United States Senate. She was sort of the classic um, establishment Republican, which is fine a lot of the time, I think, from a conservative perspective, but certainly not as strongly conservative as, as you might expect or hope out of a state like Texas. And I think Ted Cruz is on his way to winning down there and being a terrific addition uh, to the United States Senate and, and really making it a more conservative place. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we've seen nowhere with the uh, ideological lines drawn more clearly than Ohio this cycle, which we know is both consequential for the presidential race and the Mandel versus uh, versus Brown race. I know you yeah. talked a little bit about the polling and the, the dynamics, but um, could you maybe delve in a little bit on the background of Sherrod Brown's record and what Josh Mandel stands for? I mean, Sherrod Brown is a hardcore lefty Democrat. Uh, and I mean, the fact that he's done as well as he has in that state is a little bit surprising. Um, you know, he's, I know there's stuff going back years where he had been endorsed by kind of socialist type parties. Um, he is about as bad as they come in the U.S. Senate from a free market conservative perspective. And so uh, I think that Mandel, I think his biggest, um, the biggest concern that voters might have about him, or you know, uh, a chink in the armor, is, again, his extreme youth. He's very youthful looking. He's a smart guy. He just got elected in 2010 as treasurer. And one of the tactics that Brown has tried to use is to say, oh, look, this is this sort of up-and-comer guy who's getting ahead of himself and he's being presumptuous and he didn't even stay in his previous job for very long before he started running for Senate, and which is ironic because Sherrod Brown loves Barack Obama, who you know, was constantly climbing the ladder at all times. But um, you know, the, the other difference is Josh Mandel served honorably in the United States military. I believe he was in, in the Marines. He was either a Marine or he was in the Army. I think he was a Marine. 
Um, he served in the Middle East, um, and that's something that he brings to the table uh, as well as sort of a young veteran, uh, which would be also a, a fresh set of eyes in the United States Senate. There aren't that many young people, period, in the United States Senate, let alone young veterans. Um, so I think he would be a very exciting addition if he manages to win. Great. And I would like to remind our viewers that if you have questions for Guy, you can contact me at telford at franklincenterhq.org. And we can probably throw that graphic back up on the screen. Uh, we've been getting some good questions and I encourage you to submit any that you, that you may have for our remaining moments here. Um, we've got one here from one of our viewers, Guy. I know we've been talking about the presidential race, the U.S. Senate races, uh, gubernatorial and House races. Uh, are there any on your radar that you think are going to be, uh, I know, from the perspective of the House of Representatives, yeah. it's probably not going to determine control, but there are a few closely watched races of high profile individuals and uh, some key gubernatorial races as well. Are there any that you think we should touch upon for our viewers today? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, the Democrats and Nancy Pelosi were talking about trying to win back the House um, and saying they only needed to pick up 25 uh, seats total, net 25 seats. I think there were times where some political handicappers were saying maybe there's an outside shot. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, particularly because Democrats really needed to find a gold mine in California and Illinois, where redistricting, some of the few places where redistricting really benefited them. And because of a number of kind of strange developments, California actually is looking pretty good for the Republicans. Um, and in fact, the Republicans might pick up a seat or two in California, uh, maybe not net, but certainly the Democrats have been caught a little bit surprised in a couple of those races where they've gone to these jungle style primaries where the top two uh, vote getters in the primary face off in the general and in one seat where the Democrats expected to win, both top two vote getters in the primary turn out to be Republican. So it's a Republican versus a Republican in the, in the general election. Um, Illinois was another seat where I think Democrats were, or another state rather, where Democrats were looking to pick up three, four, maybe five seats. And the polling has been very close there. And Republicans look like they might hang right in there and, and maybe hang on to most of them, most of those seats. Maybe not every single one, but perhaps the majority of them. So I think prospects for a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives starting next year are very dim. Um, you never say never, but I think Republicans are feeling more confident than ever. There are some interesting races that people always uh, pay attention to. Mia Love in Utah is someone who really made her mark at the Republican National Convention. Um, an African-American woman, strong conservative, running out in Utah against an incumbent named Jim Matheson. She was considered a heavy underdog. Some polling in the last few weeks has shown that she's pulled ahead of Matheson. She got a huge amount of fundraising after the RNC, a lot of excitement there. She will benefit more than maybe anyone in the country from Mitt Romney's coattails in Utah. So um, that could be an exciting uh, addition. And then just going on the, you know, Democrats and liberals try to paint the party and the movement as a very sort of monochromatic, older, white, um, traditional party. And of course, there are huge exceptions to, to that so-called rule. And that, that in, continues to grow, I think, examples. One of them is up in Massachusetts. Uh, the Republicans might pick up a House seat in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact, uh, with a guy named, I believe, Richard Tissay, who is openly gay and a Republican. It looks like he's going to win. Um, so you've got some folks who don't necessarily fit the identity politics straitjacket that Democrats like to paint uh, who are running out there and who have a real chance to, to pick up seats for Republicans. And I've seen some people suggesting there's a chance that on the whole Republicans could actually gain a few seats in the House. I'm not willing to go quite that far, but I think the Republican majority in the House is probably secure. Great. Now a few more questions from our viewers here. Uh, the role of Hispanics in this election, we know that uh, they're voting at unprecedented levels. Uh, we know that the president was caught with some remarks the other day charging that Mitt Romney has alienated the Hispanic vote. What states do you see that playing a key role in and uh, how do you think that will split? Well, uh, Nevada, Florida, I mean Hispanics are the largest, uh, the, the most uh, quickest growing demographic in the electorate. Uh, I think that the future of uh, American elections will really hinge upon the Hispanic vote. I think if we've seen most of the national polls, uh, Barack Obama looks like he is maintaining a significant advantage over Mitt Romney among Hispanics. That advantage is actually lower in certain swing states like Florida and Colorado, perhaps Nevada. Um, we'll see. I think the president had big promises for Latinos in 2008. 
He did not even attempt to introduce immigration reform, which is one of his promises that he would do in his, in his first year, his first term. Uh, he hasn't even tried. Uh, now he seems to be saying, well, I think he, he predicted uh, in this interview with the Des Moines Register, which he tried to make off the record, um, and then they embarrassed him. So he said, OK, fine, put it on the record. But uh, he said I, he predicted that he was going to win re-election because of the Hispanic vote. Um, if Hispanics turn out at the same level as they did in 2008, and they break for Obama by the same percentage, I think that that would be a real boost to the president and could really help him win. Um, we have seen, though, some tightening, especially in important states, of that Latino vote. And also, there's a sense that younger voters and Hispanic voters tend to be some of the least motivated voters this cycle, which is obviously a stark contrast from 2008. So if the youth vote and the Hispanic vote doesn't turn out at 2008 levels and there's some sort of substantial drop off, I think that could be a problem for the president's reelection coalition. We know that also excitement with the African American vote making 28, or, or 2008 a historic election with our first African American president played a huge role. In, uh, in many states as well. Have you seen any data on African-American turnout this cycle? Well, I, it looks like the, uh, the split is going to be roughly the same. It's going to be absolutely overwhelming, 96 to 4 or something like that. Um, so the question is, will the turnout be as high? Um, we'll see. I, I know in Virginia, for example, some of the early voting, the absentee balloting from certain counties uh, and, and areas where Obama did very well last time have been down. Uh, I think it's too early to tell whether that's going to be indicative of a larger theme across the state or across the country on Election Day. Um, you know, Mitt Romney has, has attempted to reach out. Um, he pulled on, you know, Arthur Davis, the former co-chair of the president's campaign in 2008, has now joined the Romney campaign, an African-American former member of the House of Representatives. Romney went to the NAACP and gave a speech over the summer. Barack Obama didn't. Um, he sent Vice President Biden. And you know, Romney went into a tough audience there um, and delivered his message. So uh, I think the idea that Mitt Romney is going to make huge inroads in the African American community, particularly up against Barack Obama, is a total pipe dream. No one should count on that at all, uh, which is not to say he hasn't made an attempt. Absolutely. Now, one of our viewers emails, what about the enthusiasm gap? I know, Guy, you've been on the ground at both the Republican and Democratic conventions this year. You're out in states all across this country covering the election. We know that enthusiasm played a big role in 2008 with a, a huge lack thereof for uh, John McCain among conservatives and Republicans and unprecedented enthusiasm for President Obama leading to his election. What's your sense this cycle and how much of a role do you think that will play? Yeah, well, I think Jim Messina, um, the Obama campaign manager the other day, I think I saw a quote from him saying that they are at or exceeding the levels of 2008, which is just laughably <laughs> stupid. I mean, no one believes that. Um, as I mentioned anecdotally, that, that big event Mitt Romney held in Colorado a few nights ago where they had 10,000 people packing this giant outdoor venue and they had to turn thousands of people away. There's a lot of excitement there. Uh, the president was then there the next day uh, to sort of do an, you know, an answer event and uh, th the crowd was not quite at that level. Um, so you, you're, you're seeing really a lot of grassroots excitement for Romney, particularly after that first debate. I think people were getting nervous and discouraged and looking at the polls. And that was exactly what the Democrat media complex was hoping for, uh, to get people who were maybe inclined to vote for Romney to say, well, there's no point. Uh, you know, It's going to be a loss, lost cause. Um, then Romney flipped the script and totally changed the game on October the 3rd. And now it's, it is absolutely going to be a turnout election. Um, you know, and it's, it's going to depend on the makeup of the 2012 electorate. And when it comes to that enthusiasm gap, uh, we've seen conflicting evidence um, in terms of polling. A lot of polling showing Republicans much more enthusiastic. We're seeing that in terms of the closing gap in absentee and early ball balloting across the country. Uh, the question is, how much is that and how enduring will it be? Um, and I think the proof will be in the pudding on November 6th. That's what, we'll, that's what we'll eventually find out. But in terms of just the sense that you get on the ground, it's very clear that Republicans are much more excited and much more um, enthusiastic and passionate about this election than they were in 2008. And Barack Obama may be able to you know, find enough voters to show up and vote for him 
He's been on The Daily Show and on Jay Leno and on The View for a reason, trying to get low information, low propensity voters to come out and vote for him. Um, you know, that, that might succeed, but the, these giant rallies of people swooning and fainting and the chanting and all that, that is very much a, a relic of the past. He's running a much smaller, much pettier campaign based on small things, um, and we'll see if it works. In fact, I've seen uh, many folks on blogs saying, where did the Barack Obama I voted for go? I think a lot of that celebrity shine and the enthusiasm there has certainly, certainly worn off. Uh, another question from one of our viewers, Guy, and not to go all Katie Couric on you, but uh, they're thanking you for your incisive commentary here and saying this is all great information but so overwhelming. What are the news sources that you go to every day to find out uh, information about these races, polling? Where can citizens stay informed and find information that they can help share uh, with their peers as well to make sure that we have an informed public going into this election? Townhall.com. <laughs> um, I, that was the only correct answer uh, if my boss is watching. But yeah, we, we, we work very hard to have comprehensive coverage at Town Hall. Our sister site is also really, really good, hotair.com, with Alla Pundit and Ed Morrissey, Mary Catherine Hamm, and Erica Johnson at Hot Air, my colleagues at Town Hall, Katie Pavlich and Elizabeth Meineke, and Kate Hicks and Dan Dory and Kevin Glass and the whole crew, um, Heather Ginsburg, I don't want to leave anyone out here, Leah. Um, it's It's... Those two sites, um, I, I'm back and forth. I would be reading Town Hall and Hot Air every day, even if I didn't work for them, right? Um, of course, you look at Drudge. I check out National Review, Weekly Standard. If we're looking at the conservative side, I really like Jim Garrity's blog, The Campaign Spot. Jay Cost does really good work on polling at the Weekly Standard. Um, Ace of Spades is sort of a fun, irreverent blog that I look at on the conservative side of thing. The Wall Street Journal editorial board. And then, you know, I, I read sort of basic um, news sites as well. I check out what the New York Times is up to. I check out what CNN is up to. We have all three cable networks on in our office, so you can get a sense of how MSNBC is spinning something on any given day, uh, for instance. So, uh, you know, I, I just sort of click around. And then Twitter, I really do mm. use Twitter an enormous amount. Feel free to say hi and follow me at Guy P. Benson. Um, I try to retweet people. I follow Eric and, and then also promote some of the stuff that I'm working on and, and that sort of thing. So that's sort of a, a, a brief overview. Great. And we have time, I think, for one last question from, from a viewer. And they say, thank you, Guy, for the analysis of all of these uh, competitive races. Which are the ones that you care most about personally? So maybe taking your journalist hat off for a second huh. and uh, uh, setting the independent analysis aside, what are the races that most intrigue you? Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, boy. Um, well, obviously the presidential race. I mean, I, I think that there's so much at stake. I think that the results of this election really, really, really matter. I think this president has been a failure. I think he's been arrogant. And I shudder to think what a second term would look like. Um, there's, the stakes are enormous on almost every level and on almost every issue. So that, that's obviously a big one. Um, I've taken an interest in that Massachusetts Senate race, uh, not because I think Scott Brown is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I think he's a good guy and a solid guy. Um, Elizabeth Warren is a dishonest socialist. And I don't throw the word socialist around very often. I don't even use it actually generally to describe the president. She is a socialist. She is farther left than the Massachusetts electorate. She has uh, lied about her heritage. Uh, to get ahead in her career. I think that there's, there are very few redeeming things uh, based on what I've seen about Elizabeth Warren. I think that she would be a real detriment to the country in the U.S. Senate. So, um, and I think it's very close. I think she probably has a very slight lead in that race. Um, so I've sort of taken a peek at that. Um, I'd love to see Le Mia Love uh, win that race out in Utah. I had heard about her, I'd seen some videos of her, and then when she really came out, she was the first big speech at the Republican National Convention. She was like a firecracker, came out and set the tone and just lit the place up. Everyone was so excited. For her to go in and upset Jim Matheson and win um, would be, I think, really uh, quite exciting. Um, and then, uh, man, I'm just looking through all of these races. Um, they're all so important. I, it's, it's hard to like, it's hard to, to pick there's, I think three is enough. How about that? <laughs> like a kid in the candy shop here. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly some exciting races. Guy, we thank you so much for being with us today, uh, for your incisive commentary, your input, and this information that I think will be very valuable. 
to our viewers, who I'd like to thank as well for joining us for the last uh, hour, and thank you to the Leadership Institute for making this uh, webcast possible. Uh, we hope you'll all tune in tomorrow. We'll be joined by Guy's colleague from townhall.com, Katie Pavlich, to talk about her book on Fast and Furious and give us an update about that scandal. Thank you all for being with us. We hope to see you again tomorrow.